next installment of our examination of the book why I am a member of the Church of Christ by Leroy Brownlow uh, we will be discussing in this installment reason number 10 however before we turn to an examination uh, of the book uh, as has been our custom we have uh, started with uh, a scripture uh, that gives the basis or the rationale uh, for the consideration uh, of the book. We want to consider 2 Timothy 3 verse number 15 where Paul writes to Timothy and he says, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Uh, critical to note there is that Paul says that Timothy had knowledge of the sacred writings which were able to give wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. This is what we are all uh, endeavoring to attain, a knowledge of the sacred writings, a knowledge of the Bible, for in the Bible we find there uh, the will of God as it pertains to uh, to salvation and to the whole of our living. Uh, our salvation is not based on man-made tradition or family custom. Uh, it is based on what God has revealed in his word. And so this is the rationale uh, for this study. So having said that, let us turn our attention uh, to the book. Uh, reason number 10 indicates that I am a member of the Church of Christ because it believes the Bible is a book to be rightly divided. Paul would also uh, write to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 verse 15 and say to him, Give diligence to present thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, handling aright the word of truth. Uh, the Bible needs to be handled properly. Uh, you will recall that the Hebrew writer uh, likens the Bible to a sharp two-edged sword. Uh, sharp things must be handled carefully. They must also be handled appropriately. And so that figure is certainly appropriate uh, with the Word of God. It must be handled carefully and properly. It is revealed to us in Scripture that Satan himself has mishandled the Word of God. Uh, you remember in Genesis chapter 3 that he outright contradicted God's Word, uh, telling Eve that they would not die if they ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then we read in Matthew chapter 4 where he tempted Jesus uh, that he used Scripture uh, as part of the temptation, told Jesus to jump off the temple uh, because it was written that the Father would give the angels command concerning his well-being. And you will recall that Jesus answered him, it is written again, uh, indicative of the fact that Satan was not handling the word of God uh, appropriately. So when we look at the Bible, we certainly need to understand how it is constructed, we need to understand uh, the contents before we can attempt to digest them. Uh, and as we have noted, 2 Timothy 2.15, uh, Paul tells Timothy uh, the great need to handle the word of truth uh, appropriately. So when we look at the Bible, the first thing to be noticed is that there is a division uh, of the books. And when we say a division of the books, a proper classification of the books makes Bible study easier. Uh, we want to understand what is being written and for what reason, and it will help us then uh, understand uh, the, the contents uh, of any particular book. So now the Bible is divided into two testaments. Uh, one is the Old Testament, which contains 39 books. And then the other is the New Testament, uh, which contains 27 books. Uh, when we look at the books of the Old Testament, as you can see them there uh, on your screen, uh, this spans from Genesis to Malachi. And we have 
uh, five divisions of those 39 books. The first five books are known as the law, uh, reference to the law of Moses, uh, Moses certainly being uh, one of the uh, featured characters, uh, especially in uh, from Exodus through uh, De Deuteronomy. Uh, we then have the historical writings, sometimes called the books of history, uh, which would span from Joshua through Esther. Uh, we then have the poetic writings from Job to Song of Solomon, uh, the major prophets spanning from Isaiah to Daniel, uh, with Jeremiah being the author of Jeremiah and Lamentations. And then we have uh, what is called the minor prophets, uh, spanning from Hosea to Malachi. Uh, this would constitute uh, what we call the Old Testament. Uh, the New Testament has 27 books, and as you can see on the screen, the division there, uh, the first four books, uh, we typically call them the Gospels, uh, but also a biography would certainly be an accurate uh, description. Uh, they contain a biography of the life of Christ Jesus. Uh, that would be Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, there is one book of history. Uh, we typically refer to it as Acts, uh, the full name being the Acts of the Apostles, which gives us a history uh, of the early church. We then have uh, the letters, with the lion's share of them being written by uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, but also uh, we see uh, writings there from James, the brother of Jesus, from Peter, uh, from John, and also uh, from Jude. And this would uh, span from Romans through Jude. And then we have uh, one book of prophecy, the, the, the revelation of Christ Jesus. We simply call it Revelation, and that would comprise uh, 27 books. So when we look at uh, the division of the books, we also want to give consideration to a division of the dispensations. Now, when we say dispensations, that means period of time. Uh, and there are three uh, periods of time that are embraced by the Bible writings. Uh, the first would be the patriarchal dispensation. The word patriarch means father and gives reference to the fact uh, that the word of God would be given to the fathers of the families, and it was then the father's responsibility to relay the word of God to the rest of the family. Uh, this period would span from Adam, uh, whom we read about uh, in the Genesis account. It would span from Adam to the giving of the law to Moses uh, at Sinai, which would then uh, with the giving of the law to Moses at Sinai would start what we call the Mosaic Dispensation or the time when God used Moses to deliver uh, his words to uh, his people. Uh, this system grew out of the temporal and earthly blessing made to Abraham. Uh, you remember in Genesis 12 verse 2 that God told Abraham uh, that he would bless all nations uh, through his seed. Uh, this being an allusion to the fact that Jesus would be a descendant of Abraham. Also have a supporting text there in Galatians 3, 16 and 17, which is indicative uh, of that same fact. Uh, the Mosaic or the Jewish system was man's first written system of religion. Uh, Prior to this, uh, the will of God was passed on orally, uh, and again, the fathers would relay the message uh, to uh, the families, but with the Mosaic system, Moses actually received uh, the commands of God. You remember uh, that they were written on two tables of stone, uh, and thereafter, uh, the will of God was written down and then uh, able to be passed on in that form. Uh, the family system of worship was enlarged and developed into a national system, and this is where we uh, see the nation of Israel, uh, the Jewish nation. Uh, these would be the descendants of Abraham, 
and so indicative of a fulfilling of the promise that God uh, made to Abraham. Uh, number four there, one purpose of the Mosaic dispensation was to keep Abraham's posterity a separate and distinct race until the promised seed, who was Christ, came. Uh, and again, we see this uh, noted in Galatians uh, chapter 3, uh, verses 16 and 17. Uh, now, whereas I did not read that uh, on the screen prior, uh, I will read it uh, this time. I'm going to be reading uh, from the King James normally. Uh, I would be using the New American Standard. However, I have, uh, I think as a matter of habit, picked up the Bible that I use most often, uh, which happens to be uh, the King James translation. Galatians chapter 3, starting at verse number 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Verse 17, And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. One of the things articulated to us by the Apostle Paul there is that all of this is according to the plan of God. Uh, this was not a case where plan A did not work out, and so God tried plan B. Uh, it was God's intent all along. Uh, he made a promise to Abraham, and even though the law came along later, uh, the law could not nullify the promise that was made that all nations would be blessed uh, through Abraham's seed. So the law was intended to be temporary. Uh, as we will see, the law was only to the Jewish nation, uh, so it could not stay in force. It could not stay in place for all time because God had made a promise to Abraham that all nations would be blessed and the law did not uh, speak to all nations. It simply spoke to Abraham's descendants. Number five, uh, another function of the law was to be a shadow of good things to come. Uh, this from Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verse number one, uh, which reads, for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So the law was a shadow. It introduced us into what God had coming. Uh, it is the case with humanity uh, that we have to be introduced to things piecemeal or a bit at a time. Uh, we are not ready to receive uh, the end product uh, on the front end. And so God, in light of our uh, shortcomings, uh, used the law to help us along to a point uh, where we would in fact be ready for Christ Jesus. We will see the same thing emphasized uh, in another one of the points uh, coming up here shortly. Uh, reason number six, uh, another object of the law was to be a schoolmaster or tutor by which man could be brought to Christ. Uh, now, we have the scripture references here, and it is always the case that a diligent student of the word of God will go back and search the scriptures. Uh, we did not print every scripture out uh, because in volume it would have made uh, the PowerPoint exceedingly long, uh, and it takes uh, some time for, uh, I, I would not qualify as a secretary by any stretch of the imagination. I am at best uh, about a C student as a typist, and so we simply have the scripture reference, uh, but certainly would encourage you to go back and check, uh, as did the Bereans, whether these things are so. Uh, so Galatians 3.24 reads, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified uh, by faith. 
And again, that is the idea. God understanding the world was not prepared to receive Christ at the same time we had the need for Christ. And so the law identified sin, helped us appreciate our position uh, and put us in a position where we would be uh, more receptive to the gospel message. Number seven, the law was faulty. Now, when we use the word faulty, uh, this is not in the typical context of which we would think faulty. God, by his predetermined plan, uh, intended that the law would be temporary. It was not God's intent through the law uh, to meet the needs of humanity in terms of saving us from our sins. So when we say the law was faulty, uh, let us understand it was deliberately designed to point us to the gospel message to Christ Jesus. Uh, the law itself did not meet uh, the need of humanity uh, as it pertains to salvation. But again, this was not a case where plan A did not work out and God needed a plan B. This was God's intent all along. Uh, and certainly reason six that we just looked at uh, gives us the rationale. We needed to be prepared. We needed to be convinced of our sin, convinced of the fact that we were separated from God, uh, seeing the plight that we were in. And these things would prepare us or help us to be more receptive for the gospel message uh, that would come through Christ Jesus. Uh, number eight, God intended for the Mosaic or the Jewish dispensation to be temporary. We just read Galatians 3, uh, in particular verse 19, but also verse number 16. This was God's deliberate plan. I can't stress that enough. Uh, it was not a case where uh, the first plan didn't work and God had to try something else. This was God's intent all along. And one of the things we must remember is that as the creator, God understands us much better than we understand ourselves. So number nine, uh, mm, I'm sorry. Uh, concerning the Christian dispensation, excuse me. Uh, so th those eight reasons that we saw were a reference to uh, the purpose or, or the things that were true under the Mosaic dispensation, given us uh, the rationale for that period of time. The third dispensation or the third period of time uh, that we would see uh, is the Christian dispensation so named because now we see our need for Christ and the gospel of Christ Jesus is now in effect. So this dispensation grew out of the spiritual promise made to Abraham, uh, Genesis 12, 3, and also Genesis 22, 18. And as we have stated, God made a promise to Abraham that of his seed, of his descendant, all the nations of the world would be blessed. And this a reference to the fact that Jesus would be a descendant uh, of Abraham. Uh, number two, this is the new covenant of which Jeremiah prophesied in Jeremiah uh, chapter 31, uh, verses 31 through 33. And when we uh, speak of the prophets, uh, especially uh, the ones in the Old Testament, uh, they all prophesied in some way concerning God's plan uh, to redeem man through Christ Jesus. Uh, Jeremiah 31, verse number 31, Behold, the days, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it, write it in their hearts and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And so clearly it is stated there that another covenant is coming 
uh, besides the one that was made uh, with the nation of Israel uh, with the giving of the law uh, at Sinai. And this new covenant is salvation that is available to all people uh, through Christ Jesus. Number three, the change of priesthoods necessitated the change of laws. Uh, under the Old Testament law, there were priests appointed who were all of the lineage of Aaron. Uh, and this according to the law uh, that God gave uh, to the Jewish nation. Uh, Jesus was not a descendant of Aaron. And thus for Jesus to be a priest, uh, and it be according uh, to righteousness, uh, there had to be a change uh, of the law, meaning that the law of Moses, in fact, had to be moved out the way. And this is why we have an Old Testament and a New Testament. In Hebrews 7 and verse number 12, for the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. And so, the, uh, again, the argument, the reasoning is, if Jesus is to be a priest, well, he does not fit the qualifications for a priest under what the Old Testament, uh, the law of Moses, called for, because he was not a descendant of Aaron. So for Jesus to be a priest, the law of Moses has to be moved out of the way. There must be a new law in place by which Jesus... Uh, is a priest. Number four, Christ came to take away the first that he may establish the second. So we read in Hebrews 10 verse number nine. And so that so we see that all of this was done, not just according to God's predetermined will, but also according uh, to righteousness. God was right uh, now, God is the one who's making the rules, but he followed his own rules uh, in the doing of all of this. This was not arbitrary uh, or capricious. It was not something slapped together to try to cover uh, a plan that did not work. This was God's plan all along. He would prepare man by helping us understand our need, and then he would send what we needed to meet that need. And this is why we have uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is often referred to as salvation prof uh, purposed in Christ. And then the New Testament uh, is often referred to as salvation accomplished in Christ. And so there is a very systematic uh, revealing of the working and will of God as we move from Genesis uh, into the New Testament. God creates man uh, as the population grows and as we are confronted uh, with our sin problems, God sets the law of Moses in place. Uh, and then after that comes Christ Jesus, who uh, through the gospel uh, sets in place the salvation to help us uh, with our own sin problem. Number five, Christ took away the law by nailing it to the cross. Uh, now, you notice God did not just stand up and say, well, let's just change the rules. Again, there was uh, a very systematic approach uh, uh, to this. Uh, Colossians 2, verse number 14 reads, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Covenants cannot simply just be cast aside. Uh, covenant carries a little stronger force than the idea of a contract. Uh, marriage is a covenant. And if we understand the will of God, you just can't wander out of a marriage because you're tired of it. Uh, uh, there is something binding uh, when we talk about a marriage and God has made uh, provisions and if we would pay attention to the vows one of the things that we appreciate is that uh, uh, without fail you will hear uh, it being acknowledged that this is until death do us part and so uh, for the covenant to be removed God could not just say I've changed my mind I'm going to change the rules uh, there is a very systematic 
uh, process that must be followed. Uh, number one, Israel through sin violated the covenant, uh, establishing uh, 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 not just the right, but also the reason for that covenant to be removed. And so then Jesus, by his sacrifice, uh, by his dying on the cross and the shedding of his blood, uh, the old covenant is then moved out of the way and a new covenant is set in force. Uh, but I hope that we see in all of this, God did not act capriciously or, or, or on a whim, uh, that there is a very systematic way that God operated. And again, God followed his own rules. Number six, the New Testament could not become operative until after the death of Christ. And here again, we are referred uh, to the Hebrew letter, uh, this time Hebrews chapter nine, uh, excuse me, verses 16 and 17. So we read uh, Hebrews nine, verse 16, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Now, when you see testament, testator, uh, uh, those words, it, we perhaps are more familiar with the word will. And what the Hebrew writer is saying is that uh, you don't read a will, you don't uh, follow the, the provisions in the will until after the person who has wrote the will is dead. So Jesus had to die uh, before his will could go into uh, effect. And this is what we are being told in Hebrews 9 verses 16 and 17. So if the question be asked, uh, you know, concerning the death of Christ, well, one reason is uh, the will doesn't go into effect until after the one writing the will dies. Uh, but there was also the necessity uh, of innocent blood to cover our sin. Number seven, the Christian dispensation has been given to all nations. So as we mentioned, whereas the law of Moses was simply given to uh, the Jewish nation, uh, the gospel of Christ Jesus, as we read in Matthew 28, 19, where the command is to go into all nations, uh, we read in Mark 16, uh, go into all the world. Uh, so there is no discrimination uh, with the gospel of Christ Jesus. It is truly a whosoever will let him come, uh, whether we be Jew or Gentile. Number eight, today under the Christian dispensation, uh, we must obey Christ. Uh, and here, Brother Brownlow makes a reference uh, to Deuteronomy 18.15, where we find a prophecy from Moses uh, concerning Christ Jesus. Uh, Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. And so Moses himself, uh, long before the gospel of Christ was ever preached, tells us that there's going to come a time uh, when people will have to listen to Christ Jesus. And this is in agreement with Jesus being uh, transfigured uh, on the mount. And you remember the Bible says that there appeared with him uh, Moses and Elijah, and Peter makes the statement, uh, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Let us build three tabernacles, one for Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And God says that we are to hear uh, Christ Jesus. He is God's beloved son. And so this does not negate uh, what Moses and all of the other servants uh, under the Old Testament did. But may we appreciate that it was God's intent uh, that the law of Moses, that the Old Testament system uh, would be temporary. Uh, as Paul said, it was a schoolmaster. It was a tutor. It prepared us for uh, the gospel message. Let us give attention uh, for a moment to the thief on the cross. There are many people that have uh, asserted uh, I think this is where the idea of deathbed repentance grew out of. 
that the thief was not baptized, uh, that he was uh, forgiven by Jesus, and thus people today, uh, if they will uh, show a penitent spirit, are able to be baptized uh, in the absence uh, of being baptized uh, according to the command of Christ Jesus. Well, number one, Brother Brownlow notes, it cannot be proved that the thief was not baptized. Uh, when we argue that the thief was not baptized, what is really being said is that there is no record uh, in the Bible of his having been baptized. Uh, that alone does not mean that he was not uh, certainly, we are aware that there were uh, a great many people baptized uh, by John the Baptizer, uh, and it cannot be proven that he was not uh, baptized with that baptism. But I don't think that is the most compelling reason. Uh, I, I think the more compelling reason uh, is here in number two, there is no contradiction in the teachings of Christ because this was under the law of Moses. Uh, you remember we gave consideration to the idea that a will does not go in effect until the one writing the will is dead. When the conversation with Jesus and the thief takes place, uh, Jesus has not died yet. Uh, so the gospel of Christ, uh, the New Testament, the new covenant, has not yet gone into effect. Uh, so the thief lived when the law of Moses uh, was still in effect and was still the standard uh, at the time. Uh, then there is a more compelling reason. In number three, there is no contradiction because the Son of Man hath authority on earth to forgive sins, Luke 5, verse 24. The exchange between Jesus and the thief certainly took place uh, while Jesus was still here on earth. So if someone wants to argue uh, that while Jesus was on earth, he forgave my sins, uh, then uh, we would not argue that case. But uh, Jesus ascended back to heaven almost 2,000 years ago. So unless that person is upwards of 2,000 years old, uh, they cannot with any uh, seriousness or any legitimacy uh, make such a claim. We are commanded now, Acts 2 verse 38, to repent and be baptized uh, in the name of Christ Jesus uh, for the remission uh, of sins. And so again, this is why the Bible must be rightly divided. Uh, we cannot argue that we are saved under the same reason that the thief would be, uh, because we live in a different dispensation. We live at a different time. Uh, we did not have uh, the benefit of being uh, present uh, on earth at the same time that Jesus was here uh, in the flesh. And, and so we see uh, prayerfully the need for the Bible to be rightly divided, to be properly understood, uh, not just to take a, a text and to use it to uh, assert a belief uh, that we have already uh, embraced. Uh, so prayerfully, uh, this has been uh, an overview uh, of a much more complex uh, subject, especially when we talk about uh, the law of Moses. Uh, some people find the book of Hebrews very tough sledding uh, because it deals at length uh, with the law of Moses. Uh, but prayerfully in this overview, you will be encouraged uh, to uh, search the scriptures concerning the things that we have addressed and that this will aid our understanding, uh, at least in the fact that the Bible must be rightly divided to appreciate that there are three periods of time covered uh, in the Bible and that there are two testaments. Uh, one is called the Old Testament, the Law of Moses, because that one is no longer in effect. And then there is the New Testament, the Gospel of Christ Jesus, so-called, because it replaced the Law of Moses. And it is the uh, way that God deals with us uh, now. Prayerfully, as we have said, that this will be of some help. Uh, 
Again, we always welcome any uh, questions or other considerations, and may God continue to bless you in your searching uh, for the truth and in your examination and study of his word uh, and his will. May God bless you. May God keep you.